scripture reading this morning before the lesson comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. Leviticus 19, 1 and 2. I'll be reading from the New King James. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Most of us have our pet peeves, things on a personal level that really we find annoying. Some are annoyed by bad manners at the dinner table or people who bite their nails. Others have pet peeves concerning those who use bad grammar or by people who don't hold the door right as you're about to walk in or out. I can't stand it. If you were asked, are you a sinner or are you a saint? How would you respond? Because that's one of my pet peeves. Where are we? Well, let's think for just a minute. Think of how the word sinners is used in Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, as used in Romans 5, 8, the word sinners means one devoted to sin or one not free from sin. Is that you? Are you a sinner? Are you devoted to sin? Have you not been set free from sin? Because in the same book, Romans 1 and verse 7, there's another passage. And it says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called, but look at to be. It's in italics. Called to be saints. Drop the to be. What were they called? Saints. Grace to you and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as used in Romans 1, 7, the word saints means pure, blameless, and consecrated. The word saints means holy ones. Which are we? Saints or sinners? Now the fact is saints can and do sin. And sinners can and indeed do good things. But either we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ or we haven't. If we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're not a sinner. You are a saint. You are a holy one. Now, if you haven't been cleansed by the blood of Christ and you've sinned even one time ever in your life, you're a sinner. You're lost in your sins. You have not been cleansed by the blood of Christ. It gets on my last nerve to hear members of the church of Christ get up and pray we're all sinners. I ask you politely, then who are the saints? If we're all sinners, then who are the saints? Are the Catholics right and believe you got to die in order to become venerated and exalted up to a saintly position? Where does the Bible teach that? Because the entire book of Romans was written to those in Rome who were holy ones who were saints. Friends, the God of the Bible, whose name is Jehovah, Psalm 83, 18, is holy. Now recall the principle we laid out a few weeks ago from Psalm 115 and verse 8. With regard to idols or false gods, they that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Think. Mankind becomes like that which he considers his God. The heathen of olden times worshiped bloody, warmongering gods and act the same. So we ask, is Jehovah a sinner? Is Jehovah a fornicator? Is Jesus a thief? Is the Holy Spirit the author of confusion? No. 
God is holy. And he expects us to be what? Holy. Today's sermon is entitled, God is Holy. And we need to act the same. Three things we want to do. First, the holiness of God implies a standard. And God holds himself to a standard. Think of our scripture reading in Leviticus 19, 1 and 2. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye, that's you plural, that means all y'all, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, God is holy in the absolute sense, which means that all three members of the Godhead have never sinned, not even once, not in attitude, not in action, or any other possible way there may be to sin. Therefore, in view of the fact that God is absolutely holy, it is unwise and, in fact, blasphemous to accuse Jehovah of moral atrocities throughout the ages. I want you to consider a few passages with me this morning. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And let's observe what some people feel like is a moral atrocity committed by Jehovah. And it's not. Some people think that they are more loving than God, and that's flat out false. That's not true. 1 Samuel 15, beginning in verse number 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, this is the not Saul of Tarsus in the New Testament. This is the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel, Saul the Benjamite. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people over Israel. Now therefore, look at the instruction. Hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. That means what Samuel's about to tell Saul to do, you need to go do this. Says who? The Lord told Samuel, you go tell Saul to do this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. How he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek. Look carefully. And utterly destroy all that they have. What do you mean? And spare them not. What do you mean? Give it plain. But slay both man and woman, infant, and suckling, ox, and sheep, camel, I'm going to use some Christian imagery here, donkey. Now why the instruction to kill the infants and the animals? Wow, that's a moral atrocity. Is it? Or is it not? Well, back up to the book of Leviticus. And let's go look in Leviticus 18 this time. I want to present to you something for you to consider as to why the Lord would have said what he said. Now, he gave a little bit of instruction there in verse number 2, didn't he? 1 Samuel 15. But look back here in Leviticus 18. And let's read verses 22 to 25. Leviticus 18, 22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Now pay close attention. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. Don't you, as a man, lie with a man, you don't do that. Don't you lie down with beasts, don't you do that. Don't you practice these weird perverted things. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these, all these sexual perversions, the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And look how the Lord looks at it. The land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Now Israel, that is Old Testament fleshly Israel, was both civil and divine. God has always used nations to punish nations. You ought to look at Ezekiel chapter 21. You can see that just as plain as day. The sword of the Lord in many contexts is a nation of people. 
And yes, he would even use heathen nations, such as Babylon, to accomplish his goals and his tasks. Now think back to what Saul was told to do in 1 Samuel 15. Why the infants and why the animals? Well, Leviticus 18, 22 to 25 gives us some insight as to why. Number one, those infants were in a safe condition. They didn't lose their souls. God took care of their souls. But think about what else happened. They didn't have to grow up being abused. Like what? With sexually perverted filth and garbage. They didn't have to be abused and misused that way. And certainly they didn't have to grow up to practice those idolatrous things that their people by and large were practicing. So let me give you some advice. God holds himself to a standard. Anything God has ever said or ever done was morally right, pure, and holy. Now, God, since God holds himself to a standard, God holds humanity to a standard. Go with me to the book of 1 Peter. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1 Verses 15 and 16. Does God hold himself to a standard? Yes, he does. Emphatically, he declared time and time again, you need to be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is what? Holy, sacred, sanctified, set apart. So be ye. That's a plural pronoun. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's King James language. Generally indicate our conduct, our manner of life, the way we think, the way that we act. What are we to be? We're to be holy. Because it is written. I know once where it's written, and you do too now. Leviticus 19, 1 and 2, right? Because it is written what? Be ye holy for, do you see for? Say why. Why be ye holy for? I am holy. Now, Jehovah is different than many, if not most, earthly parents. He does not hold himself to a lower standard than what he expects of humanity. You know what problems happen sometimes in the home? The parents will say, do as I say. Don't do as I do. They will say what is right to their children. But they tell them, here's the standard that you need to hold, but I'm going to go live like this. Now, is that how the Lord is? Does the Lord live that, like that? He tells us to be holy, and then he's going to live somewhere down here. Oh, no, not at all. God holds humanity to a standard because he holds himself to a standard. Now, when God forbids certain actions, and indeed he does, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, Rest assured that no member of the Godhead has ever committed one of those sins. The standard for man is not one another. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, if we were to judge ourselves by ourselves, friends, we're not wise. The standard is not me. The standard is not you. God is the standard for mankind's holiness. The standard is not custom. The standard is not culture. The standard is not creeds. The standard is not our own conscience. And in fact, our standard of holiness is not even the old covenant. Our standard of how we're going to be holy is the New Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in fact, our standard is Jesus himself. If your Bible's like mine, flip the page. Look at 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 21. What's our standard of holiness? Jesus and the New Testament. 1 Peter 2.21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ, that's Jesus, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Who is our example? It's not Brock. Who's our example? Friends, it's not Moses. It's Jesus. Leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. In whose steps are we to walk? We say, well, I'm not as bad as brother so-and-so. Well, I live better than this bunch or that bunch. You're, you're using the wrong standard. 
The standard is Jesus. My Bible teaches in Hebrews 4.15, and in this context, he never sinned. There's the standard. Look at it. You should follow his steps who did, whoops, no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But what did he do? Committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who, his own body, bear our sins. Jesus suffered. Why did he suffer? He didn't suffer because he was a thief, an evildoer, a busybody. Why did he suffer? The text says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sins. Notice that. We don't need to die in sin. We better die to that practice. Being dead to sins should live. Notice there's something we're supposed to be dead to, but we're supposed to live. Live unto righteousness, right doing. By whose stripes, that's Jesus, you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Friends, the holiness of God implies a standard. And the standard for us is not one another. It's not anything else. It's Christ in the New Testament. Now in the second place, the holiness of God demands separation. Back up with me to the book of Isaiah. Let's see what Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 has to say. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Now God separates himself from sin. How many times have we heard through the years that sin separates us from God? Passages like Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 are read or quoted. Bring in passages like Romans 6, 23. How many times have we heard them through the years? It's untelling. But you know what? It's true. Sin separates us from God, and God separates himself from sin. Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. There's a problem here, but the problem is not the Lord. There's a problem going on here, but the problem is not with the Godhead. Where's the problem? But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, the holiness of God means that God does not fellowship error and darkness. God is light. Didn't you read that somewhere in the Bible? And in him is no darkness at all. That's pretty much what 1 John 1 5 says, isn't it? Now, while God is aware of everything that occurs everywhere, Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the righteous and the evil. He sees everything that goes on everywhere. He is never, not once ever, pleased with sin. In fact, Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 makes it clear that God hates sin. Now, recall that Jesus is our standard, and Jesus never sinned. I can look at 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Friends, isn't it time for us to allow the Bible to form our minds and stop fitting our preconceived ideas to the Bible? Instead of trying to find ways to say, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. God expects us to develop the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. What kind of mind did he have? He never sinned. Never sinned, not even once. Not an attitude, not an action, nothing. He never sinned. And it's time for us to develop that mindset. Why? Because God is separate from all sin. God is holy. And he expects us to be holy. Now, in view of the fact that God separates himself from sin, I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians 6. Because God expects humanity to, to remain separate from sin. God separates himself from sin, right? So what does he expect of us? To live in it? To waller in it? To keep on practicing it like it's not a big deal? What does he expect us to do? He separates himself from sin, so what do we need to do? We need to separate ourselves from sin. Observe what the text says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. Be ye not. Now how much plainer does it need to be stated? Would it need to be stated any plainer? 
Because really this section of scripture doesn't need explanation as much as it needs obedience. We don't need to stand here and explain it. We can read it. We can see that and say, I got it. Let's just go do it. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Is that what it said? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? God is light and in him is what? No darkness at all. So he's not a, a, a two-faced person. He's not like many of our parents. He's not saying one thing and doing something else. He's telling us what to do and he practices it. Verse number 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? How would you answer those? Verse number 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God, the church, the church of Christ with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore? That's a conclusion word. In view of this evidence, what are we supposed to do? Come out from among them. Go run that them down. Who is it? Who would it be? Come out from among them and be ye. He doesn't say in fellowship with them. What does he say? Be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You know what? I don't really complain about too much, but I wish that chapter had not ended right there. Because chapter 7 and verse 1 goes right with it. Having therefore these promises, what? I will be your God. You will be my people. You'll be my sons and my daughters. But you've got to come out from among them and be ye separate. Right? Conditional promises. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. That means I have to do this. I have to make up my mind on my own. This is an individual instruction to us all. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear, the reverential awe of God. But if you don't do what's right, you ought to be terrified. Now, is that plain? Now, that section of Scripture simply requires obedience. The explanations and applications will take care of themselves. So let's stop trying to invent ways to justify sinful behavior among me, among you, among our children, among our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones. Let's stop trying to justify it and start doing what the Bible teaches. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now third, the holiness of God demands sanctification. It implies a standard demands separation, and now in the third place, the holiness of God demands sanctification. You're aware that God practices perpetual, that means ongoing, solid black lamp, perpetual sanctification. You know, Isaiah wrote one of the most, to me, one of the most profound passages in the Bible. In Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, Jehovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. Isn't that amazing? And the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah understood. I ain't supposed to be seeing this. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That is amazing. You think God is part-time holy? You 
I wish we could ask Isaiah. Isaiah, what do you think? Is God part-time holy? Is he, is he, is he kind of close to what we might be? Not even close. Not even close, friend. God practices perpetual sanctification. Sanctification is the ongoing process of remaining holy, set apart for holy uses. Holy, 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 as used in Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, probably does not indicate the three members of the Godhead so much as it indicates the absolute holiness of God. Did you know? that a New Testament writer mentioned Isaiah 6. Did you know that? So we don't have to wonder about who it was that Isaiah saw. Did you know that in John 12, verses 37 to 41, the inspired apostle John affirmed that Isaiah saw Jesus. Who was that on that throne, high and lifted up? Well, Isaiah understood it to be the Lord of hosts. But John the Apostle makes it plain. You know what Isaiah saw? He saw the pre-incarnate word of God. He saw the man who later became known as Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't that amazing? Now, our religious friends who deny the eternality of Jesus as the eternal word have not studied their Bible the way that God expects. The Father, the Word, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are pure and holy. So when we read that we're expected to be sanctified and that we're to practice sanctification, how do all three members of the Godhead practice it? Are they part-time or are they full-time and perpetual? You see a lesson there for us? Are we to be part-time sanctified? It's Sunday. I need to put on my sanctified clothing. It's Wednesday. I need to use my sanctified holy tone speech. That's not the way Godhead does it. And friends, that's not the way we need to do it. Now, God practices perpetual sanctification and God expects humanity to practice perpetual sanctification. Look with me in the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're going to observe one verse. Acts 20 and verse number 32. Now, it is beyond question that sanctification is of the Holy Spirit, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But how... Does the Spirit sanctify? You know, Paul sheds much light on this process in this text we're about to read, and also in Ephesians 6 and verse 17. Acts 20 and verse 32, Paul is speaking to the elders of the congregation of Ephesus while at Miletus. This is Paul speaking to an eldership. Look what he says. And now, brethren, Acts 20, 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and what's the word of God able to do? It's able to build you up and give to give you an inheritance among all them which are what? Sanctified. You know what saints are? They're sanctified. They've been cleansed from their past sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what Ephesians 6, 17 says? The last part of it says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, do you understand that the Spirit sanctifies as we obey the New Testament? Hence, Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Pet peeves, don't we? If I were to start running my fingernails across a chalkboard, would you? Would that, would that be a pet peeve? Would that annoy you? You know, you can you hear it even now? We all have our pet peeves. We all understand that. But know this, there are big differences between saints and sinners. You know what the biggest difference is? The biggest difference is the blood of Jesus Christ. That really is the dividing line between the saints and the sinner. Consider two passages very quickly with me. 
Consider them very quickly with reference to the blood of Jesus Christ. The first one is Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince, prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What, according to Revelation 1.5, washed us from our sins? is when we were in Christ's blood. Now think of Acts 22, 16. Parallel those together in your mind. Remember what Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, but Paul the apostle is now repeating it in Acts 22, 16. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. What's the only thing that can wash away sins? The blood of Jesus Christ. Where did Paul have his sins washed away? When he arose and was baptized. Now why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. In fact, this is how you call calling on the name of the Lord. Do you see it? Do you see it? You know, it's probable that someone walked in here today as a sinner. But you don't have to walk out a sinner. You can walk out of this building a holy one. A saint. One who has been sanctified and cleansed from all past sins. Sign me up. What do I have to do? Glad you asked. You've got to hear the truth. Acts 18.8. Believe the truth. Acts 16.31. Repent of sin. Acts 17.30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8.37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. You know what happens when you do that? Your past sins are washed away and you're added by the Lord to the church, Acts 2.47. You don't just go under the water and we hold you under and drown you. We don't want you to die. It's the death of the old man, but it's also a picture of the resurrection. You've been raised up to walk in newness of life. Those past sins have been washed away. Now you're a Christian. You're a child of God. We're a servant of righteousness. We do whatever the New Testament teaches us to do for the reasons the New Testament says to do it. But there's a but. Even good servants sin. Is everything over once we sin as a Christian? Oh, no. But we, there's something we can do to be forgiven as Christians when we sin, and the sad reality is we, we will. But we try not to, but even if we do, there's hope. What do I have to do? Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and now pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. Wherever you are, let your request be known now. Together we stand as we sing a song of encouragement.